Welcome to Tanuki Fishing Webinar. The Art of Modern Casting Level Eye with Robert Worthing. Robert is co founder of Tenkara Guys LLC in Utah. Tenkara Guy in uh, LLC also hosts the Oni School, which taught by uh, uh, Masami Sakaki Bara, the living legend, Tenkara master in Japan. And Masami is really good at uh, fishing with the uh, level eye. So, what is uh, the level eye? The level line is um, the monofilament line. When we're talking about here, is the level line is the monofilament line, and it uh, about eight pound to fourteen pounds test. Uh, casting the uh, eight pound to fourteen pound set can be very intimidating for a lot of fly fisher or even the ten color fisher. And most of us uh, would use the called a full line or the tip line. It's easy to cast. And uh, but the fishing is not as fun as to cast with the level line. I went to only school and um, I have learned so much about how to fish with the level line. I have casting with the level line before, but I don't know how to take advantage of it. So uh, the school have opened up. Uh, uh, the school have opened my mind about how to use it and use it better. Um, basically, it's a more effective way in catching fish, and it's a lot of more fun. Uh, especially casting, even more fun with the casting too as well. And uh, Robert also one of the instructors at the school. And I have learned so much about casting with a level eye with Robert and Masami and how to fish with a level eye. So if you have the opportunity to take the Masami school, please do so. Uh, it's a great uh, way to uh, to learn about fishing. Fishing with level line, it also brings me up a totally different level of uh, fishing. It's a lot of fun. Um, and casting with a level line, even more fun. So uh, I would like to introduce Rob. Rob, um, are you ready to take it over? Yeah, sure. Um, as uh, Luong mentioned, uh, um, I'm Rob Worthing with Tinkara Guides. Um, I uh, have been fishing and guiding Tinkara for about 10 years now. Um, and Luong mentioned how long I've been using level lines. It's, it's about the same. We, we adopted level lines pretty early in the process. One of the things that I think is the greatest advantage of, of Tinkara, possibly the greatest advantage of Tinkara, is the ability to use an ultralight uh, system, an ultralight rig. And the use of uh, level lines, fluorocarbon level lines, really, uh, uh, you know, takes great advantage of that. Um, what I enjoy about my fishing the most is is casting. Um, I was once asked, why do I fish Tenkara so much when uh, I, I do know that, you know, I can do similar things with a rod and reel. And my answer was purely because of the aesthetic of it. I just really love the aesthetic of, of Tenkara fishing uh, and in particular casting. And so starting uh, maybe six or seven years ago now, uh, I really started to work on my personal casting. Um, that really was elevated to a new level when we met Oni. Um, Eric and I, Eric Ostrand, or one of the other Tenkara guides, had really started to do a lot of rotational moments in our casts, a lot of aerial mends. And we had sort of almost stumbled upon that uh, just in the act of our fishing together uh, and, and felt like we were onto something, but didn't really know what it was. And then we met Masami Saki Kibara, um, AKA Tenkara no Oni. And uh, we saw him introducing those same rotational moments in his casting. And all of a sudden we knew we weren't full of shit. Um, you know, there was, there was actually something to this, um, uh, just before that, or around that same time, um, I began using stop motion software to analyze casting strokes, um, not only of, uh, Masami Saki Kibara, but, uh, other, uh, Tenkara masters that I was, and anglers that I was, uh, fortunate enough to fish with and, and really made a study, um, in particular of Oni's style of casting. And um, that's what I'd like to share with you today. 
and hopefully instill some of the, the love that I have for that aesthetic of, of Tenkara fishing and that emphasis on casting. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out with a, uh, uh, a, a relatively in-depth look at the mechanics of the overhand cast, uh, you know, basic overhand cast, because you can't move on to more advanced techniques, introduction of rotational moments in your casting, playing with currents, et cetera, et cetera, until you really hone in that uh, overhand cast. So I'll start with that, and I've just got a series of, of a few slides. Um, anybody that's seen me speak knows that I hate PowerPoint and thinks it's essentially a creation of a devil. Um, but uh, we're going to use a few PowerPoint slides to get uh, some figures across, um, heavy on video. And after reviewing that overhand cast, I want to pause for a minute and uh, take some Q&A from you guys. Um, so hold your Q&A questions for now, and I'll open that box up uh, when I finish with the first round of slides here. Um, it's only about 10 slides. Um, we'll use that time to kind of, you, know, you guys can ask troubleshooting questions. You can ask me questions specifically about, uh, you know, what level lines I use, what, what size, when, et cetera. Um, whatever you're interested in. Why am I hanging up on my forward cast? Um, you know, why can't I get all the line out there? Uh, why does my line wobble so much, uh, you know, at the end of my cast, um, whatever the, the, the situation is. And then after that, depending on how much time we have left, we'll really start to, uh, we'll, we'll begin to scratch the surface of advanced casting with the introduction of rotational moments. And that will rely very heavily on video. Um, so, so I sort of have two different sections there. Um, and in the middle, we'll have a brief Q&A. Um, so if that's okay with everybody, I'm going to go ahead and start here. I am going to share my screen. Everybody able to see the presentation here? Yes. Good. So let me go back to the beginning. So here's the 101, the introduction to the overhand cast. The first thing I want to start with is, is explaining the grip on the rod. Um, and a little bit more depth than we perhaps had before because how you hold your rod is, is the beginning of the whole process. Um, there are three options you can kind of see on the screen there. The first option is a thumb on top version. Um, the second, uh, the third option is a finger on top at, at 12 o'clock option. And then the middle picture is somewhere in between with the thumb at about 11 o'clock, uh, 10 or 11 o'clock and the finger at about one or two o'clock. Um, the way I prefer to hold the rod is, is that middle version, and I'll tell you why. Um, starting with the thumb on top version, the thumb on top version is, is great for power. Um, if you have an extremely long or extremely tip heavy rod and you don't want to get tired all day and you don't want to risk, uh, you know, a, a, a tenosynovitis of the, of the finger tendons, then that might be the way to go. If you have weakness because of uh, some medical, uh, uh, you know, concern, osteoarthritis, whatever, then that thumb up top might, might be the way to go too. The disadvantage of that thumb on top is that you lose the, uh, the tiny little uh, controllable movements that you have in your fingers because you're relying on more powerful, uh, uh, you know, grip muscles. The finger on top gives you uh, some of that uh, minute control um, but it strains that uh, pointer finger quite a bit, especially the flexor tendon of that pointer finger. And I've actually seen a lot of uh, uh, Tenkara anglers get some uh, uh, tendon problems in that extensor, uh, 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 with the extensor indices or index finger extensor muscle. Um, so, so as a result of that, I don't prefer that one either. It's also a little bit limiting when you start introducing rotational casting. Uh, to have that finger on top and try and keep it on top all the time. So the picture in the middle, uh, the, the middle grip, we'll call it, uh, is really my preferred method. Um, it, it's the best of both worlds. You get the uh, fine motor control uh, of your uh, finger uh, flexors and extensors, um, but you are also stabilized and able to rely on heavier muscles to do the, the uh, grunt work throughout the course of the day. And we'll kind of go over that a little bit more. Um, two other points about that grip there. Number one, uh, notice that my finger is on the blank. I don't always keep it there, but it can be really useful to have your finger on the blank every once in a while because you're able to feel uh, the graphite react to your casting. And with time, you'll actually learn to feel when that rod loads to the greatest extent on the back cast. 
and, uh, and improves your timing, the timing of your cast as a result. The other thing that you'll notice hopefully in all of these pictures, but especially that middle one, is that my grip is extremely loose. Uh, if you clamp down on that grip, two things happen. Number one, you get tired faster. And number two, you, get, uh, uh, you, you lose a lot of the fine motor control. So actually gripping that rod tight uh, makes you less accurate and less precise with your casting. Second point after the grip is how we're gonna stand. And I just snapped a couple pictures in the backyard today to try and uh, introduce this. On the left-hand side of the screen there is what uh, is known as a closed stance. A closed stance is like uh, throwing darts in a bar. Your strong foot, the same foot that you're holding the rod, is forward and your uh, weaker foot is backward. On the right side is what's called an open stance, and that's the opposite. That's where the, uh, the weak foot, the foot opposite of the rod, is forward, and the strong foot is back. Now, there's a couple things about both of these pictures that are important and, and a little bit the same. Number one, notice that in both pictures, I'm in a relatively athletic stance, a little bit of an aggressive stance. And what I mean by that is that, um, you know, my knees are bent. They're not locked. Um, I have my weight planted very firmly. Uh, my center of gravity planted very firmly over the ball of my foot. Um, in both of these cases, it's more over the forefoot. Um, and that those points remain really important, can actually make a huge difference in uh, casting once you get on the water. Having that aggressive or athletic stance, really making sure that you're balanced the whole time. Now, having said that, what I will greatly uh, uh, encourage you guys to do, especially when you're learning and when you're practicing, is try and stick to the stance on the left, that, that closed stance. The reason why is because in the closed stance, you have less uh, dimensions of freedom in your movement with that rod hand. In other words, I can't really, like on the back cast, I can't really turn my torso all that much. But in the picture on the right with that open stance, um, in that back cast, I have all kinds of, of, you know, range of motion. You can imagine me sort of twisting my torso in that right picture on a back cast. I've got a lot of range of motion. And, and that's just, uh, you know, when, when, you, when you dial in your cast, either one of these stances you'll use, uh, especially on the water. Um, but in the beginning, that open stance just provides too much room to, to, to get sloppy with, um, too many different... Uh, degrees of freedom to try and control. And so that closed stance on the left is preferred because it tightens you up a little bit and allows you to really concentrate on what the rod uh, arm and hand is doing as opposed to trying to think about controlling your torso, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a real quick introduction of just how to start out here, grip and stance. Now, when we're talking about casting, the overhand cast, the, really our goal is to get a tight loop. Um, a tight loop it allows for efficient energy transfer in between the rod and the line. Uh, and, and that tight loop will cut or pierce the air or wind very easily. With a tight enough loop, it shouldn't be a problem at all to push a Japanese number 2.5 level line, which is the equivalent of maybe 10 pound test, uh, through a pretty decent, decent breeze. Um, there is also no issue at all with taking that same 2.5 level line and, you know, casting 30 feet of it effectively. Um, that all depends on tight loops. So how do we get tight loops? Well, the line does what the rod tip does. So in A over here, um, we see that if you, if your, if the tip of your rod traces an arc, then you end up with an open loop. So what we've got to do to avoid open loops and close that loop is get our rod tip to trace a flat uh, line above, above our head as opposed to an arc. So that's the goal. Now, how do we get there? Well, just like the line follows the rod tip, the rod tip follows what your hand does. Only every movement of your hand is, is, is mag magnified substantially at the end of a 13-foot rod. So in that open loop scenario, um, and this is probably the most common uh, issue I see with, with uh, Tenkara casters when we're working with people on their casting, um, is, is relying too much on wrist. If you rely too much on wrist, and, and you can do this yourself while you're sitting there, 
um, especially with a stick or a, or a rod in your hand, closed rod in your hand. If you rely completely on wrist, what happens is you cannot help but trace an arc. Um, I can demonstrate that here in a second, but hopefully that's clear. You can, if you rely on wrist, you cannot help but demonstrate arc, or, but, but trace an arc. And that's gonna give you an, 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 uh, um, an open loop. So what we've got to do instead is flatten that, 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 uh, that curve like we talked about. And the way to do that, the way to trace a flat path with a rod tip is to elevate the hand during the cast. Um, the way we affect that is actually with uh, a chop of the elbow. And the interesting thing is this actually, this movement actually comes not from elbow flexion or extension, but actually from the shoulder. So, you know, we go back to that grip that I use. I, I take advantage of that stable in-between grip, and that allows me to fine-tune my cast. But at the same time, I'm actually relying on my shoulder muscles to do the brunt of the work throughout the day. And that get, the combination of those two things gives me that flat trajectory. So this is what it looks like in Oni's hands. We'll have a couple of stills, and then we'll look at some video, and then we'll open up the Q&A. So this is a standard overhand cast. This is Oni standing on the Provo River, uh, in middle of Provo River in, in Utah. And he's using his type three rod, which is about a 340 centimeter rod, 3.4 meters. And he's casting a line that's, that's uh, anywhere from one to 1 1.5 times the rod length. Uh, and that includes tippet. And what I wanna point out here is two things. Number one, how little wrist he uses. You can actually tell how much wrist someone's using by watching the butt of the rod come away from the wrist. So if you can imagine him doing a back cast from B to A, you can see that the butt of that rod doesn't come off the forearm very far, just an inch or so. There's really not much wrist break there. The, the, the way he gets his movements is not from that wrist, but rather the elbow. And you can see that from, from two to one. So imagine if we're doing a back cast, you can see that he raises his elbow from the number two position to the number one position, and then drops that elbow back down from number one to number two. So again, less wrist and more elbow chop, which comes from that shoulder, that deltoid muscle, is how to get, how to trace that flat trajectory and how to begin tightening up your loops. Now, this is the same rod in a different parking lot, still in Utah, um, but this time on that 3.4 meter rod, Oni's uh, casting what I, if I remember correctly, was a nine meter line, so about three times the rod length. And this was a very breezy day. We'll see some video here in a second. Now check out the, the, the angles again here. Let's start with going from B to A. Pretend like this is a back cast. So we're starting at B and going to A. And you can see that butt of the rod still doesn't come off of the wrist very much at all. But look at how much elbow chop he introduces now. So imagine him going from the number two position to the number one position on the back cast. And then on the forward cast, the number one position back to the number two position. All of a sudden, you know, what we saw before was a, was a tiny little bit of elbow when that line was the same length or a little bit longer than the rod. But now that it's three times the length of the rod, that elbow chops a heck of a lot bigger. And the reason for that is because you actually have to trace a bigger uh, line uh, with your rod tip in order, to, in order to move that long line through the air. And I'll show you that here in a second. This is how the angles break down for Oni. On the, the top picture is that, is that, uh, that same casting uh, on the Middle Provo River where he's using a, a line length that's the rod or a little, or, or, or 1.5 times the rod. And you can see that with every single cast, he, his back cast stops at about 90 degrees and then he drops forward to about 30 degrees. Back cast to 90, drops forward to 30. And again, it's with that elbow more than it is with wrist. With the longer line, he still stops at about 30 degrees, but he comes back substantially more, usually 120 to 130. Again, that's, that, that's tracing that bigger line, that bigger 
portion of the of the pie uh, of the clock to move that long line through the air. So that's what's necessary when you're doing a standard overhand cast and you're starting to move with longer uh, move into longer lines. Now I'll tell you a little secret with this before moving on. I spent about a year trying with this stop motion analysis software trying to cast exactly like Oni and after a while it dawned on me that it was uh, stupid to try and do that not only because he's got you know 30 years of experience on me um, but uh, because our our bodies are completely different and that was sort of an epiphany for me so I started out trying to go 30, 90, 30, 90, and I was doing okay with that. But when I went to long lines and I was trying to get tight loops and perfect cast with a long line, trying to match this 30, 130, 30, 130, it just wasn't working. The difference is that I'm six foot two. Oni, I don't know exactly, but I probably got a foot on him. Uh, my hands are larger, my arms are longer, everything's different. And so what I realized is that I actually had to change these angles a little bit in order to get a, 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 the tightest loop I could possibly get and really take the next step in my casting. So for me, at six foot two, instead of 30 to 90, I go to more like, uh, I actually come back a wee bit further, maybe to 100 degrees, and I stop a little bit higher to four, at, at 45. With a long line, like a nine meter line on the type three, a 3.4 meter rod, I come all the way back to uh, about the same, 130, 135, just a little bit further. But again, I stop a lot higher at about 45. Um, keeping that tighter in at my height uh, allowed me to match Oni's uh, casting. Obviously, he's better than me, but match Oni's casting uh, with respect to tight loops and being able to cast into the wind. But I had to make that little tweak, and each, and each one of you, I think, is going to have to kind of figure those angles out for yourself. But this is an outstanding place to start, especially if you're closer to the, you know, uh, five foot to five foot ten range. Above that, you may have to find that you have to change the angles a little bit. But regardless, you know, if you compare Oni's angles and my angles, you know, five foot two to six foot two, um, you'll realize that we're in each of these situations, we're tracing about the same uh, line, distance of a line in the air. It's just that my angles are a little bit uh, tighter in order to create that because I've got longer arms and I'm further up off the ground, et cetera, et cetera. So interesting look at angles. Um, let's see what it looks like live. So this is only casting that uh, Type 3, 3.4 meter line with a line length that's about 1.5 times the rod. Again, notice he doesn't use much wrist. The power of the stroke actually comes in lifting that elbow a little bit right here. The other thing I want you to notice is this timing. There is really, at this length, there is almost no pause on the back cast whatsoever. He brings that, that line forward almost immediately. You see, when we're using these ultralight rigs, like level line, the rod has to do all the work. It's not like having a heavy PVC line on there, or even a triple line, PVC line, um, where you let the line load the rod, or you let heavy flies load the rod. That's not the case here. They're not present. We're using an ultralight rig. So to get that ultralight rig out there, we can't rely on the line straightening out behind us in the back cast and pulling on the rod. It just doesn't have enough mass to do that. We introduce all the energy into the rod on the back cast. And instead of waiting for that energy to translate into the line and then back into the rod, we have to start the forward cast before that rod starts wiggling and bleeds all the energy out into the, into the universe. So again, having that finger on the blank, you can actually feel the point at which that rod is at maximum bend. And you can start to learn to, to tighten up that timing. You know, I mentioned before that one of the mistakes that we frequently see with uh, Tenkara casters when we're helping them with their cast is using too much wrist. Um, this is another one. I see people pause for way too long on the back cast 
where you really want to bring it forward again when that rod hits maximum bend in the back cast that's when you want to initiate your forward cast so here's the long line version again you can see he's tracing a much larger arc he still doesn't use much wrist but look at how big that elbow chop is that elbow chop is huge now here he's got a nine meter line he pauses a little bit longer on the back cast, but it's still hardly any time at all. We actually have a zoomed out view of this same cast. Um, he's casting against a red rock background. And what you see is that he actually initiates the forward cast about the time the tippet to level line connection gets past the rod tip on the back cast. So not even halfway before the line is completely straight out behind him. It's long before that. So it's a very rapid stroke. And again, that's because the rod has to do the work. You gotta start that forward cast earlier. If you don't, all that energy is just gonna bleed out into the universe. So that's section one there. I'm gonna pause for a second and let you guys do some Q and A before we do the second portion here. So we got a couple of questions. Ah, Dennis, Rob, where are you buying your Stealth Shadow Gray Line? <laughs> um, so the Stealth Shadow Gray Line that he's talking about is uh, a another uh, very lightweight option. It's actually uh, it was produced by Sunline, and it was called Reaction FC. I chose it because it's exceedingly supple, um, but it has the density of fluorocarbon, so you can get an ultra light and ultra low profile. Uh, line. I used it in an 8 to 10 pound test, which is the equivalent of, of number 2 to number 2.5 Japanese level line, thereabouts. Um, uh, you, could, you could get that suppleness, strike detection, um, uh, and control the line in the air, but at the same time, uh, the density of fluorocarbon. Um, prior to uh, more advanced fluorocarbon lines that are out now, the only way you can get that suppleness is with a nylon line, which is one of the reasons why a lot of the competition anglers rely on nylon so much. Um, the Sunline Reaction FC was also uh, dyed a stealth gray. Um, instead of a translucent line, which can actually uh, create a relatively large shadow from refraction, reflection, et cetera, of light, um, uh, stealth dyed lines in grays and greens frequently um, are used in order to uh, make that line even more uh, invisible. But that also means it's invisible to us. So uh, that's actually another tip for guys that are really trying to hone in on your, on your casting skills. Um, we spend a ton of time in the yard practicing casting. And I mean like, you know, a ton of time. Um, the best way to do that is to actually do it in short snippets. So maybe you, uh, you know, just go out for five to 10 minutes a day. But by doing that on a regular basis, you'll be amazed at how much you advance. Five to 10 minutes, maybe 30 minutes is way better than one two hour session every three or four days for the vast majority of people. Um, when we go out and practice, I try and utilize the same rig to practice with each and every time. Maybe it's a number 2.5 uh, or number 3.5 level line that's 1.5 times the rod length. And I don't, you know, do anything different until I really have that dialed in. Um, the uh, last tip, and this is where the, re the relationship to the Sunlight Reaction FC comes from, is that if you're really going to practice, uh, you got to know where you're casting. Uh, and using that Sunlight Reaction FC to practice would not probably be the best idea because you're not going to be able to see it. Uh, it's nice on the water for not spooking fish in really, really spooky conditions, if you know exactly where to expect that, that, that you know, uh, uh, cast to end up, where that fly is gonna end up. Um, but otherwise, mm, uh, tough to use. Um, the Sunline Reaction FC isn't available anymore. It's been rebranded. Um, I, I can't remember to what, but you can find out on Sunline USA's website. Um, Scott Walker asked, the grip is the butt of the rod braced against your forearm. So that's a great question. Um, is everybody able to see me okay? Luong, can you confirm? Yes, I can see you. Good. I see the full video. Uh, let me see to check the message. Yes, people say yes. 
Okay, good. So um, here's what I'm going to do. Um, I am going to, well, now I got Luan's view. One second. Okay. So there are two, eh, I can't see that rock quite as well. Let's go to this one. There are two things that I would recommend um, as practice. And I'm going to kind of, I'm actually going to turn this way to show you. So if I'm out practicing, you know, I, I do like to practice with that finger up here um, on, the, on the blank like I talked about. Um, uh, but there are other advantages when you're practicing to choking up on this. Um, one of them is that when I uh, uh, am practicing or am I, I, when I'm teaching somebody or practicing for myself, um, there are two drills that I really kind of like to use uh, in concert with each other. The first one is meant to get rid of too much wrist which again is an exceedingly common problem with people. I'm gonna switch back here. Because I think you can actually see this one better. Yeah, so I'm up here. Um, the first one to get rid of wrist is, and again, this is, this is a drill, is to not allow the butt of that rod to come off of your forearm at all, at all. I mean, slam it against your forearm. If you have to, you can put it inside the sleeve of a shirt, use a band or anything else, but don't let that rod come off of your forearm. Use it as a brace for the wrist. And by doing that, and then figuring out how to cast, you'll start to get that elbow motion a little bit more correct. Once you have that down, um, you can start to organize your grip a little bit more, loosen up and introduce a little bit of that wrist like Oni was doing. But getting rid of too much wrist is a majority of people's problems, including mine. And so I usually start the day, you know, just like playing field sport or anything else, you start the day with, with drills, right? With uh, basic drills. Well, this is my basic drills. But for the first few casts, I might just keep that rod tip completely, uh, you know, take the wrist completely out by bracing it with that, with that rod uh, handle and concentrating on that elbow motion. After that, um, the elbow motion looks really good, but a lot of times people are putting too much power in their cast. So the second one that I like, and this is a little bit more of a challenge, is to learn to, to adopt an exceedingly loose grip. That loose grip is going to give you the most accuracy and most precision in your casting. And the way to do that is to try and hold the rod with just two fingers, just like that. Um, essentially, keep your arm in one position. And see if you can cast equally as, as, as uh, accurately by pushing the rod forward with your index finger and then catching it on the butt of your, of your hand, the butt of your thumb here, and pushing it back like that. Just like that. Now, well, again, what that does is you're still not able to introduce very much wrist because your, uh, uh, you know, your finger uh, and, and the butt of your thumb is going to stop you. Um, but what you're really learning to do is loosen up that grip and use less power, rely on less power. Um, so, you know, every time I go out in the yard, a few casts like this to get that elbow right, a few casts like this to loosen up that grip, and then I'm ready to really kind of get after it and do what I want to do. So two good drills there, especially if you find yourself uh, using too much wrist. Um, Jeff Abramson said, recently gone from grip number three in your pictures to grip number two. Uh, grip number two is the one I have. Usually uses a 360 rod um, with a line about a foot longer than the rod and four feet of tippet. So all total, you're probably uh, 1.5 times the rod length. I like that length. I get a pretty good turnover with a level line, but as I moved from 4.0 line down to 3.5 or 3.0, um, he gets progressively more line in the water. Um, in front of the fly as it lands. With 3.0, I may end up 1.5 to 3 feet centimeters on the water. Um, gotcha. So I'm reading the rest here. Um, how can I improve a smaller diameter level line? I think uh, the most likely, it's tough without seeing you, but the most likely uh, reason for that is because you actually don't have uh, very uh, tight loops. There's some lack of efficiency in translating the, uh, uh, the rod uh, uh, energy into that uh, ultralight line. 
it could be that you're pausing too much on the back cast. It could be that you have too much, uh, uh, you know, too much uh, wrist. Um, both of those could be possibilities, but somewhere you're, you're losing that efficiency. If it's not from pausing too much in the back cast, then it's because you have open loops. Um, so here's one thing to consider. Um, number one, you know, first make sure you're not pausing on that back cast. But number two, on a nice blue cloud, uh, blue sky cloud free day, go outside. Uh, and instead of looking at a target or looking down in the grass uh, when you cast, look up at your line and see what your loop's doing. Now with the Tinkara cast, especially if you're using that closed stance that I talked about, it's pretty tough to watch the line unfurl behind you, but that's okay. Um, a lot of times if you tighten up the loop on the forward cast, the back cast kind of follows. So, uh, or, or, or vice versa really, you're not gonna get uh, tight loops on the forward cast unless you have a tight loop on the back cast probably. Um, so, so that's actually something to, to, to consider is, is really, you know, start looking at your line. Uh, instead of instead of at a target. Now, by the way, if for anybody that's out there trying to get their accuracy and precision down by you know placing a target out in the yard, um, I, I like to use. I've got a six set, a six uh, inch plate, a six inch diameter plate, um, and I like to put that out in the grass because every time the fly hits it, I get this little ping, uh, and I know I've hit my target. Um, but if you're using if you're utilizing a target and trying to get your accuracy and precision better. Uh, consider also, instead of looking at the target, look up at that line. If you can look up at that line and get your loops tight, you'd be amazed at how many times you actually hit the target. I'm willing to bet that uh, most of you are actually going to hit the target more if you're looking at your line than if you're looking at the target. Um, again, this is something I do for practice, but I don't necessarily do on the water. Um, but when I'm practicing, um, I will do that sometimes. If I'm having trouble hitting the target, I'll start looking up at my line. Um, same way a golfer looks down at his ball when he strikes, as opposed to looking at the hole all the time. So hopefully that helps, Jeff. Um, if not, uh, let me know. Um, I actually use that same stop motion software and can do uh, remote coaching for people um, and their casting. John Clark says, uh, when practice casting, what should we have on the end of the line? A fly that's easy to see. I think it's a good idea. Um, alternatively, you could use uh, that ping that I talked about um, against a you know uh, a piece of metal, um, a porcelain plate, etc. Porcelain plates are easy to get. Um, so so that's what I prefer. I, I like to hear that ping. Um, if you're, I, I would recommend practicing. You know, it's better to practice like you play, right? Um, so I would recommend practicing with a fly that you would normally use. I would not recommend trying to practice with a very uh, fluffy uh, fly. Don't try and, and, and maximize visibility to the point where you're tying, uh, you know, a massive fly that's extremely uh, uh, resistant in the wind because um, that's just going to change the game. But, but try and practice casting with the flies that you're using to fish. Uh, that'll help once you get on the water. I'm at a point where I leave the hook on. Uh, because I'm hitting that plate, uh, you know, eight to nine out of 10 times. Um, uh, you know, if you're not, and you're getting in the, you know, you're getting in the grass uh, quite a bit, uh, then you may want to go ahead and just uh, snap the, the, the end of that hook off um, and, and, you know, continue casting with the rest of the, of the fly. Um, alternatively, every once in a while getting hooked in the grass uh, will teach you really quick how to get snags undone uh, once you get to the water. Um, John Clark, when, oh, no, nope, same one, right? Um, Jerry Olson, what is the difference in casting strokes, et cetera, when casting a lightly weighted nymph rig compared to the dry fly or kabari? For me, there's, there really isn't a difference. Um, I, and that's very specific to, to, to my nymphing, I think. Um, most people, when they're nymphing, uh, many people, when they're nymphing, utilize the weight of the fly to get the, uh, uh, you know, the, the rig out there. I do not. Again, I, I love the aesthetic of, of Tenkara casting. Um, I love the aesthetic of, of the Oni school of Tenkara. And uh, I learned so much about utilizing currents, et cetera, um, and, and presenting the fly specific ways to increase my catch rate in Oni Tenkara 
that I wanted to bring that over uh, when I chose to, to nymph fish, uh, you know, with, with weighted flies instead. So uh, you're, you're starting off correctly if you want to do that uh, same thing because you say you're using a lightly weighted uh, nymph rig. Um, but I use a lightly, a very lightly weighted nymph rig. I pair it with a rod that can handle a little bit of weight. Um, and, and then uh, I execute the same casting stroke or nearly identical casting stroke that I use in Tenkara. My rig is still lightweight enough that uh, I am relying on the rod to do the work. And you'll see even more of that when we get to part two of this with advanced casting. Essentially, every one of my casts, just about every one of my casts has a rotation in it, a rotational moment. And that's how I play with currents and get the fly to do exactly what I want, get that presentation just right. My, Mike McLean, I'm still at freezing temps now. What line do you recommend for cold temp fishing? Um, that's a hard one. Uh, I'll tell you my experience. Um, I don't know that there's any perfect solution. I don't like, uh, you know, greasing lines and the like uh, to, uh, you know, try and avoid ice up. Um, you know, some people do that. I just don't like carrying that much stuff and I don't like, you know, seeing a grease slick on the water. Um, so I never use any product like that. Uh, I, I, you know, have tried furled lines. I used to rely on furled lines because I thought a little bit of weight helps you push through the wind. I now realize that uh, with better casting strokes, that wasn't necessarily necessary at all. Um, in using furled lines, especially in uh, windy winters in Utah, we found out pretty quickly that that furled line holds water in between the furled uh, in, in monofilaments and uh, freezes and, and can really become difficult to cast very quickly and extremely heavy. So in my mind, you're losing out on that major advantage of, of Tenkara, the ability to use an ultralight rig. So my favorite in, uh, in winter conditions and in uh, low freezing temps is still level line, um, the smallest diameter I can get. Um, so a lot of times in winter, I'll be fishing with number 2.5 level line until I just can't and I've got to use something else. Um, but by doing so, uh, by keeping that diameter low, um, I tend to form beads. Um, you'll get pearl beads of ice on, on a level line. That tends to form up a little bit less for me, um, for whatever reason, when I'm using a lower diameter line like a 2.5 compared to like a 4.5. Um, in order to deal with those uh, inevitable pearls of ice that are going to form on your line, there's a couple things you can do. Um, one thing is just to run your fingers down the line real quick and get rid of most of it. Um, the other thing uh, that, that uh, um, another thing is actually to hold the end of the line if you're not using too long a line and twang it like a guitar string and most of the time all the, all the ice pearls will fly off. But I don't have to do any, either one of those anymore. Um, I've actually learned a, a technique uh, that's the same technique that I actually use to get snags off which is, for lack of a better way of doing it, a Zorro of sorts um, with the rod. And the quick snap of the line back and forth in just the right Z pattern uh, tends to pop those uh, pearl beads off. It's still a pain in the ass though. Um, and once those pearl beads uh, form up, it's, it's tough to, to keep fishing or want to keep fishing um, because the rig gets so heavy. 1.5 length means line leader and tippet. Sure. Um, for me, usually when I'm talking about, it, it doesn't really matter. For me, when, when uh, I'm talking about line lengths, I'm talking about the length of the level line. So I like to teach people and personally use a line that is uh, at least a couple to a few feet longer than the rod. I used to start people off with uh, level line lengths that were the same length of the rod. Um, but I don't do that anymore. I tend to push people a little faster and I found that they adapt just as fast if that line is two, three feet, three feet, four feet longer than the rod. To the end of that, for practicing purposes, I tend to add uh, not too much tippet, um, maybe uh, 2.5 feet. And for me at six foot three, that's the length from, you know, me holding the tippet here to the same shoulder. That's 2.5 feet. That's 3.5 feet. This is the most tippet I ever use, uh, you know, when I'm fishing. This is the tippet that I tend to use most often. 
occasionally I will use a tip, but that's as short as, as 16 inches, which for me is from my hand to my elbow. Um, I prefer uh, a little bit shorter tippet when I'm uh, practicing, especially in the beginning when I'm teaching, uh, because again, you're able to see the level line and you're really reacting to the level line more than you're reacting to uh, uh, the fly and the tippet. So keeping that tippet short can give you more feedback in the beginning. Sometimes I get a clunk at the top of my cast, particularly with longer lines. Steve Elder, I, I think you mean when you, uh, I'm, I'm gonna guess that's when the fly hits the top of the rod. Um, and that's what you mean by a clunk. Um, that is, uh, again, the same two problems. It is either uh, pausing too long on the back cast or you've got an open loop. Um, and, and again, the most common reason for an open loop is too much wrist. So it's, it's one of those two problems. It's either the timing or, or too much wrist. I'm willing to bet. What's happening is you have that, that open curve like this. And on the forward cast, because you have an open loop back here, that, that loop dips and ends up hitting the top of your, of your rod. And I think that's what you mean by a clunk. Um, if, I'm, if I'm wrong, PM me later and, uh, and we can work on it together. Gavin, I'm relatively new to Tinkara. Will this casting method work well with other types of lines, tapered, traditional? It will, yeah. Um, there is uh, an alternative method if you're using, uh, by traditional, I'm presuming you mean, you know, furled or, or, or uh, 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 woven, et cetera. Um, uh, if you're using a furled line, uh, that is really a heavier setup and the same cast can work quite well. There is at least one alternative, uh, among, uh, Japanese Senkara fishers. Um, and that's, uh, uh, a casting method that Fuji, uh, uses. Fuji is a, is a, a another Tenkara master. Um, and the way I describe it for anybody that has a rod and reel background and has done some, some casting of a rod and reel um, is if Oni's cast, Masami Saki Kubara, Oni, if his cast is, is more like a Joan Wolf uh, West Coast style cast, um, where you're really picking up that hand and using, uh, uh, you know, you use the shoulder to pick up the elbow, the elbow picks up the hand and you trace a flat trajectory that way. If Oni's cast is more like that, then Fuji's cast is perhaps more like Lefty Cray, an, an East Coast school Lefty Cray cast. Um, it's quite a bit more open. Um, and, uh, and he, and the reason why I mention that is because Fuji uses furled lines. Um, he actually furls lines for Nissan, I believe. Um, uh, I have a few and, and they're stellar lines. Um, I, I tend to prefer the level line for the reasons mentioned before, um, you know, pushing that ultra light advantage of Tenkara. But if you like using furled lines, um, you know, try the Oni school and, and, and see if you can get some videos of Fuji casting as well. Both of these uh, uh, Japanese masters have books, by the way, if you, if you happen to have uh, uh, the ability to read Japanese. Um, I'd highly recommend them. Um, but uh, hopefully that answers your question. Um, let me know if you have others. How does length of rod affect the casting? Um, I don't know. That's from Paul. Uh, for me, I don't know that it does all that much. Um, I tend to, uh, rod length in and of itself, I don't believe affects the casting so much. Um, you do have to be a little bit more delicate with a shorter rod. Uh, actually, I don't think that's true. Um, you have to you have to be more careful. I I, I tend to have, to have to really concentrate on not over gripping uh, shorter rods, but I think that's my shortcoming, and I don't know that that's shared by by you know uh, you know everyone. Um, uh, so I have to concentrate on that on over on not overpowering uh, both of my grip and my cast when I'm using a shorter rod and a shorter rig, uh, and that's because I use longer rigs a lot. Um, when I'm using a longer rig, I feel like I have to be uh, um, more precise in my, uh, uh, in the angles, um, you know, and you can imagine you've got a longer lever arm. So moving your, uh, you know, moving your hand an inch with a 15 foot rod is, uh, 
uh, you know, is going to be a little different at that rod tip uh, compared to moving your hand an inch with a 11 foot or 10 foot rod. Um, so, so maybe more delicate with a shorter rod, at least for me, um, in that grip and making sure I'm not overpowering. And then with a longer rod, just really emphasizing the precision of my movements. Stevie Lee, how important is the rod flex in casting? Is there a certain flex that works better than others? Uh, yes, uh, for me. Um, I always, I always uh, hesitate to say that one way is better than the others, uh, than any other. You know, I'm, I'm one of those guys. Uh, I'm very fond of saying there are no truths in fly fishing. Um, there are no absolute rules that you can go by. Um, but here's some guidelines. When you're starting out, a, 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 a stiffer rod, a little bit stiffer rod, um, can be an advantage because uh, it just gives you uh, more control. Um, it can be an advantage. Um, it gives a lot of people more control. There's a subset of people that actually do better with a flexible, a more flexible rod in the beginning. Um, and we kind of tease that out when we get to work with you live, but I don't know how to describe that. Um, so in general, I tend to recommend a little bit on the stiffer end uh, when you're starting out. But you don't want a broomstick. You still have to have the tip of that rod flexible enough so that the rod does the work. Um, uh, you know, you don't want to use a stiff rod that you would be throwing, uh, you know, heavy bait with uh, and try and use that on an ultralight level line rig. Um, uh, as you advance a little bit, if your rod is too stiff, you will find that a lot of the rotational casting that I'm going to talk about here in a minute, those aerial men's, uh, they are very difficult to do with a stiffer rod. Um, so, so for me, there's a marriage in between. Uh, my favorite rods by far for fishing with, uh, and this should come as no surprise because I've modeled my casting after them, uh, are the Oni rods. Um, in particular, the two that I use are... Um, the Oni Itoshiro, uh, which is a 340 rod. Um, I use this for small fish, uh, mountain freestones, especially the brook trout uh, here in the Appalachians. And then my personal favorite of all time is the Oni Type 1. Now this has a different handle that I've retrofitted it with, but this Oni Type 1 is a fantastic, phenomenal rod. It's 13 feet. Um, it was very specifically engineered by Masami Saki Kibara to cast uh, Tenkara flies, um, uh, uh, you know, at great distance, um, uh, you know, close in, et cetera, et cetera, with uh, great precision and accuracy. Um, I consider this for me, this is kind of like my Ferrari. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm absolutely convinced. I used to be scared about giving uh, new anglers uh, um, a rod like this because I felt like um, it was too much to handle and people would get frustrated. But what I've actually found is it's the opposite. Um, this rod almost forces you to, uh, to you know, hone in that casting relatively quickly. So the Oni Type 1 is my favorite rod. The Oni Ido Shiro is the shorter rod that I use. Um, the other difficulty in answering your question is there really isn't a universal uh, description of rod flex uh, in, the, in the fixed line world. Um, for, for If you really want to get in the weeds on that, uh, Teton Tenkara uh, had, a, had a, a post up uh, that describes uh, rod flex, et cetera, to a great degree and is a really useful uh, blog post read. Joseph, do you have beginner level line recommendations, color brand, et cetera, for small streams? Um, no, uh, I think anything that's bright that you can see uh, in it is going to take a little bit of, uh, um, uh, a little bit of uh, personal uh, uh, exploration. Um, for most of us, uh, an orange line is going to be the most visible. Uh, pink might be the second most visible. Green uh, is the third most visible. Uh, so I usually recommend people try to reach for a very high visibility orange line, especially when they're starting out. Um, I think a good place to start is number three or number 3.5 level line uh, as far as size. Um, and any of the major brands is, is fine, uh, I think, uh, in the beginning. Have I tried using tapered line? I have. I actually, the 9 meter uh, and 12 meter lines that I practice long line casting with in the lawn are tapered nylon lines. Um, and, and I use those because uh, um, 
they've taught me quite a bit about timing, uh, the timing in, in, in long line casting. And after you get good with that tapered line, uh, casting a level line is, is quite nice. I, I haven't used tapered lines in my personal fishing because I do like the freedom of being able to change lengths uh, very easily by simply snipping off a little bit or, or, or you know, what have you um, with level line and really being able to dial into the conditions at hand. Um, so for that reason, I'm kind of shied away from tapered lines in, in my fishing. Um, and overall, I just haven't felt, found them necessary once I really tighten those loops up. George Mann, uh, should the line be off the water and only the tippet and fly in the water? Um, in the beginning, I would recommend uh, striving for that. Um, there is uh, definite advantages to having the level line off the water and only having tippet and fly in the water um, uh, from, a, from a fishing presentation standpoint. Um, but like I said before, there are no truths in fly fishing. There's no absolutes. There are definitely times that you will learn uh, when uh, varying line is, is important in catching fish. Um, so in particular, I would strive for it, and particularly because this uh, is about casting, right? Uh, if you can learn to land that fly first and only the fly, then you've really honed in your precision and accuracy of your casting. Um, beyond that, after somebody learns that with an overhand cast, I tell them to try and land the fly softly and try and land the fly smack down into the water so it creates a splash with that same overhand cast. That's sort of phase two of learning an overhand cast. Oni said, heavier line for larger flies, do you agree? Uh, yeah, so, so again, that's not an absolute rule. Um, Oni does uh, tend to switch to a number four uh, line when he's using uh, some, some of his larger Oni flies, um, and his flies can be quite big. And that does balance the casting quite a bit. Um, he may sometimes also reach for a, uh, a larger diameter line, uh, like a number four in uh, particularly rough and windy conditions, um, or when he's going for very long lines, but that's not always the case. If it's uh, spooky conditions, um, sunny, low water, calm water, using smaller flies, uh, um, then he may reach for a, a smaller diameter line. Um, uh, you know, each one is a variable and you kind of have to make a conscious decision about where you're going to accept a little bit of compromise and where you want to really boost your advantages. Any books I recommend that are in English? Eric, unfortunately, no. Um, <laughs> uh, there are some great books that are fun reads. Morgan Lyle just put one out. Uh, that, that is a very fun, uh, I thought was a very fun read um, and includes some fundamentals. Um, but I, 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 I always hesitate to say that I recommend books in English for anything other than uh, the basics because I just haven't found uh, um, a book in, written in English that I think does the advanced uh, uh, fishing techniques of Tenkara justice. Um, Discover Tenkara uh, uh, probably got the closest. Um, I did really enjoy their book. Um, I, I didn't read it all the way through, I'll admit that. Um, but the snippets that I saw, um, uh, you know, uh, looked quite good. Um, but I, I really just haven't seen anybody tackle the, the, the techniques that, that, um, that I really enjoy using anyway. There's a lot of schools that take car out there, though. Let the dog in, he wants to be on TV. There's two of them. Uh, one of them's sick right now. I'll let him in here in a minute. Um, have you used floating PVC lines? Um, does it defeat the line off the water idea? Again, I don't use floating PVC lines when I fished in Cara methods because uh, um, I, I think the real advantage is the ultralight, uh, you know, the ability to cast ultralight rigs and fish with ultralight rigs. And so I push that with, with level lines. Uh, on a different note, I do use PVC floating line when I'm bass fishing. Uh, um, and I do that because I'm trying, I need to push heavy uh, sliders, poppers, et cetera, through the air. And uh, um, I have not yet found a way to push a really big wind resistant fly like that through the air using a, a reasonable weight level line. Mario, are you using line cider at the end of the leader or other type of indicator? I'm not. Uh, the vast majority of the time, I'm using a relatively high visibility uh, um, you know, level line. Um, when I'm under spooky conditions, uh, I go for a milky white line. I, I want to say it's made by Vulcan, but I always seem to get that wrong. 
um, and, and it's relatively stealthy, but it all, you know, fish can't see it, but that also means I can't see it very well. However, I've honed my casting to the point where I know where to expect my fly. And so I almost don't need to see the line all the time anymore. But if I'm in real tight conditions, uh, lots of overhanging trees, et cetera, et cetera, and I need to really use advanced casting techniques to go around all those obstacles, um, I might still, you know, utilize a, 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 at least a portion of, of a, a colored line, a high vis line, um, so that I can see where that cast goes in the air. Um, in my Tenkara method of fishing, I don't otherwise use a cider or an indicator, though. Rob, which level line are you using these days? I'm using the um, Oni line. Let me show you the two that I use. By the way, Orvis Mirage Tippet, outstanding fluorocarbon tippet, comes in 100 meter spools. So right now I'm packing these two, um, which is the uh, Nissan Pals line. Um, I use orange 2.5. I like the orange color the best. It's what I prefer. And I use 2.5 80% of the time. Um, so, uh, um, so, so that's kind of what I have my orange in. Um, I have number four in pink for the times when uh, um, I just really want uh, to match a very large fly uh, and, and uh, create that beautiful aesthetic in casting. Um, and I just chose pink because it's different from the orange and I can keep them separate. Um, when things are really spooky, let's see if I got the other one. Nope, I don't have my Vulcan line, my, my milky white line with me, but I can show you guys later. Robert found your article in Takara Angler. Ah, I've been using this as a re reference. Is it still good to use? Yeah, Stevie. Um, so for those that don't know, I, I wrote a series of three articles on, on casting. Um, for Tinkara Angler, I want to say it was back in 2012, or I don't know when it was. Um, anyway, um, yeah, I, I think it is potentially still a good reference. The interesting thing about that, uh, we, we use different language now. Back then, uh, we hadn't, uh, we had just started working with Oni, if I remember correctly, or, or it was near then. And um, we described the rotational moments in the advanced casting that we were doing in terms of dimensions and using anatomic terms like supine and prone. You might see some of those if I get to the second slide deck. Um, uh, the, the, that article follows that nomenclature and can, it can be a little tough to, to follow as a result. Um, but beyond that, I actually made it really, really tough to follow. Um, because I'm, I'm a, a university professor uh, by day, and uh, um, there is a specific type of teaching uh, called, uh, um, oh, I always forget the name of it. I'll remember here in a minute. Um, uh, but anyway, this type of teaching uh, basically uh, forces your brain to concentrate much more than it normally would. Um, uh, and causes you to retain more information and understand to a greater degree as a result by making the material exceptionally difficult to read and get through. Um, there's different ways of doing that. Um, the interesting thing is that the same teaching technique is essentially what's used in a lot of medical schools traditionally um, and in special forces training in the military. Um, and it works wonders right up to the point where it causes uh, post-traumatic stress. So <laughs> enjoy the articles. If you can get through them and, and commit to them, I, I think they are interesting because um, I think the, the, the best thing about those articles is that after laying the groundwork, um, it presents you with a progression table, a progression of skills that, that, that build not only the, the coordination, but also the muscles that are needed to do some of these advanced cast, casting techniques. Um, that, you know, the, the concept of a progression is, is an athletic concept. It's borrowed, you know, gymna gymnasts do it, rock climbers do it. Um, you, you, you know, don't do certain moves until you do, you know, more basic moves. Um, and, and that progression table that's in there, is, I think, is, is highly valuable. Um, but, yeah, enjoy it. Um, if you commit, the, the people that have committed to it um, uh, and have muddled through it have, have given me really good feedback. 
Um, uh, but there's a lot of people that, you know, that, that commitment's just not for them. In the best con conditions, what's your typical level line size for traditional Kabari Tinkara fishing? I use 2.5 level line a lot. Um, and unlike Oni, um, I, I actually have found, I don't use flies that are quite as big, big as Oni. My favorite fly is the size 10 red ass monkey. Uh, one of my only, or one, one, of, one of my personal patterns. Um, that size 10 red ass monkey um, is still a big fly. And if I really wanted to balance the casting uh, perfectly and get that perfect aesthetic, I probably would use like a number 3.5, maybe four level line. Um, uh, but um, I have actually found that I prefer casting with number 2.5, even when using a big fly. And I actually find it easier uh, a lot of times to cast a lower profile, as in lower diameter line, like a 2.5, in heavy wind uh, compared to a number four uh, level line. Um, uh, you know, one of my partners, John Viterli, tends to kind of follow a similar school. Um, and, 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 you know, that's where I'm at right now. Maybe with another 30 years of uh, practice and experience, I'll be, uh, uh, you know, a similar skill set to uh, Masami Saki Kibara, and I'll change my mind. Um, but right now, that's kind of where I'm, where I'm fishing. So uh, instead of getting ahead of the questions, I'm getting behind. Um, it's 8.09. I'm going to answer two or three more questions, and then I'm going to pause and, and get through a couple of the, uh, uh, a couple of the other uh, slides here. Um, when you're using a lightweight nymph, you're not letting any of the high vis line in the water, are you? Uh, sometimes I am. It depends on what depth I want to get to. Um, again, for me, there are no trues, there are no absolutes. Um, you got to kind of uh, um, figure out which ones you know you want to uh, uh, go with. Um, how do you handle drag with Rob Butler? We lost your question. It just says, hand, how do you handle drag with? I'm not sure what the... Uh, feel free to clarify if you want. Um, Jim, got to go. Looking forward to seeing you at the Oni School. Heck yeah, brother. Look forward to it too. Um, so, I may have gotten through all the questions. Okay. So, um, how many people do we still have around? 76? Yeah, pretty good. Um, Y'all, I'm going to move on to uh, some advanced casting. Um, and uh, after that, we can do a little bit of Q&A again. Um, uh, hard stop for me is probably uh, um, in about 30 minutes. So we'll see what we uh, uh, get through. So I'm going to share my screen again.